Hi students, welcome to the notes on ionic compounds that include polyatomic ions. Let's get started. Here's the essential question. I would write this at the top of your page and really think about it throughout these notes. How do you write ionic compound formulas and names including polyatomic ions? Well, what is a polyatomic ion? Here's two examples. One of them is phosphate, PO4, and another one is hydroxide, OH. These are compounds that have an overall charge. Notice that PO4, or phosphate, has a charge of minus three, and hydroxide has a charge of minus one. Now, these are important because we can use these compounds as a whole in an ionic compound. And so if you look, PO4 with a minus three charge can be used to attach to other metals to create an ionic compound. Hydroxide being a negative one charge can be attached to other elements like potassium to create an ionic compound. So we can use polyatomic ions as char charged parts in an ionic compound. Now, this is the list of polyatomic ions, and this is found on your periodic table. We give it to you and let you know that you don't need to memorize this list, but you should know where it's at, and you should use it often. This list is organized by cations and anions and their various charges, and it lets you know what the compound is and what its charge is. This is not something we can rationalize using the periodic table and the elements. We just have to be given this list and trust in it. So how do we use polyatomic ions? Let me give you two examples. One example is a regular ionic compound with a metal and a nonmetal, And another example is a similar compound, but this time we're gonna include a polyatomic ion. So here's aluminum. It's our metal with a positive three charge and selenium is our nonmetal with a negative two charge. How do you put these two together to make a compound? Well, you probably know that aluminum being positive three and selenium being minus two, you would need to cancel their charges out. So we would need two aluminums with a positive six charge and three seleniums equaling a negative six charge. That would give us our compound formula of Al2Se3. Our next, next example includes a polyatomic ion, SO4. SO4 is called sulfate if you were to look at our polyatomic ions list. By the way, if you haven't pulled out that list or found the list in, in your folder or online, it might be a good idea to do so. So here we have aluminum with a positive three. Notice sulfate as a whole compound has a charge similar to selenium. What that means is we can treat it like selenium. We still need two aluminums, but we need three sulfates. So we're gonna take that sulfate and we're gonna put a little three, a subscript on the outside to represent that we need three of them. That cancels the charge of each. The last one's just a general formula. For whatever we have with a negative two charge, our aluminum with a positive three charge will always equal the compound Al2 and whatever the compound cation or anion is with a little three. The key idea here is, is that polyatomic ions are treated the same as similarly charged elements, and that makes them really easy to deal with. Notice I didn't do anything with SO4. I kept it in parentheses. I didn't change the subscripts. I didn't worry about the subscripts. I just treated it like a normal element. All right, so what about naming ionic compounds with polyatomic ions? How does that change? Well, when we see polyatomic ions in a formula or a name, we just use whatever the list is on the periodic table. We trust that list to give us the information that we need. Sometimes we ignore the ending of "-ide", which is, again, what would be given to us on that list. So let's take a few examples. NH4Cl. NH4 is our um, polyatomic ion. It's what was listed on there. And if we look on the list, it says that NH4 is ammonium. So this is ammonium chloride. The next example, BeNO32, notice NO3 is in parentheses, that is our polyatomic ion. And if we look on our list, that NO3 is called nitrate. So instead of changing the ending to ide, we just call this polyatomic ion nitrate, and this would be per beryllium nitrate. The last one, NaOH, OH is our polyatomic ion. If we look on the list, that polyatomic ion is called hydroxide. So this compound is called sodium hydroxide. Now these examples here give us a few hints on how we recognize polyatomic ions. Some students struggle being able to recognize whether a polyatomic ion is in there or not. So let's take a look at both the formulas and the names. 
The formulas are pretty simple. If you ever see a formula with more than two types of elements in it, then there's a polyatomic ion in there. Now, our first example has nitrogen, hydrogen, and chlorine. And if we look on our list, NH4 is a polyatomic ion. Our second example has beryllium, nitrogen, and oxygen. So there's more than three types of elements in there. They include polyatomic ions. Now, names are a little bit more challenging, but Couple hints, if names include non-elements or things that don't end in "-ide", those are two ways we would know that there's polyatomic ions in there. Ammonium, for example, is not an element on the periodic table, but if you look at our list of polyatomic ions, it's there. Nitrate, in our second example, there is an element called nitrogen, but this doesn't end in "-ide". If it was nitride, that would be nitrogen. This ends in eight. So anything that doesn't end in "-ide", is a good indicator that there's a polyatomic ion involved. The last one does end in "-ide", hydroxide. So this one's a really challenging one. But again, on the periodic table, there's no element called hydroxide. There's an element called hydrogen and an element called oxygen, but hydroxide is a polyatomic ion and found on our polyatomic ions list. All right, so here's a practice. Pause this video and test your knowledge. Do you understand what's going on? See if you can figure out the chemical formulas for sodium phosphate versus sodium phosphide. How are they written differently? Did you try it yourself? I really recommend that you pause the video and try it. I'm gonna go ahead and help you with this if you do need help. Here's sodium phosphate. Phosphate, it ends in eight. That's a good example that it is not a normal element. It's a polyatomic ion. So this is sodium and then phosphate, if we look on our polyatomic ions list is PO4 and that phosphate has a charge of minus three. So we can write the formula Na3PO4. That's three sodiums and one phosphate to cancel each other's charge. Sodium phosphide, this one ends in ide which means that this is a normal element. Phosphorus or phosphide is what we're looking at. So sodium and phosphorus. Sodium being a positive one, phosphorus is also a minus three. So similar formula, Na3, but this time it's just a phosphorus instead of a phosphate. All right, here's a couple warnings for you. These are huge student misconceptions and problems that I see often that I want you to try to avoid. Let's say we're given a problem magnesium hydroxide and asked to write the formula. Well, here are three bad examples and one good example. Our first bad example, MGHO, I believe this student took hydroxide a little too literally. They said, oh, hydroxide is hydrogen and oxygen, so they just wrote that there. Well, Hydroxide is actually OH, it's magnesium and then the polyatomic ion hydroxide. So that student didn't write that formula correctly. Now, here's the problem with this. Let me show you what hydro MGHO looks like in terms of a compound. This is the atomic model of that. Now, if we look at the good model, this is what the good model looks like, MGOH2. This is what our formula should actually look like. All right, MGOH2, so this student right here, in this second bad example, was actually off to a good start. They just didn't execute it correctly. This student probably knew that magnesium was a positive two charge and hydroxide, according to the periodic table, is a minus one charge. So they knew they needed two hydroxides, but what they forgot to do was put hydroxide in parentheses, if you take a look at the good example. What this does is it gives it two hydrogens, but not two oxygens. And so the compound is incorrectly written and the compound itself, the atomic model looks incorrect. The last one, the student had similar problems. They probably knew that there was two hydroxide, but they foiled that little two in with the parentheses, and they gave it two oxygens and two hydrogens. This is what that molecular model would look like, again being incorrect to the true model. So Mg, magnesium hydroxide, is, two, is magnesium with a positive two char charge, hydroxide with a minus two charge. It needs to be Mg, and then in parentheses, OH with a little two, because we need two hydroxides attached to our one magnesium. All right, last thing, if the general rule for naming ionic bonds are metals and then nonmetals and then typically ending in ide, how does the rule change with polyatomic ions? Well, polyatomic ions, you just use the name given to you on the periodic table, whether it be the first thing in the compound or the last thing in the compound. Some polyatomic ions do include the, the suffix ide, but many of them end in other things like ate or ite. All right, that leads us to the end of the notes. This is a good time to review and highlight key terms. 
ponder and ask, write some questions down and try to figure out the answers to those questions. And then don't forget to summarize and answer that essential question. Good luck.